Aachen from the Alpen Adria Universität in Klagenfurt. So I know Barbara for a long time. I remember my first postdoc, we shared office in Linz. <laughs> she was doing a postdoc as well. And uh, ever since we have met uh, many, many times uh, during my, one of my postdocs in, in Germany, she was also in Germany, she was one of my collaborat main collaborators in the Humboldt Foundation. And today she is here uh, for the first time in Brazil. After many invitations, she finally came, so I'm very glad. And she's going to talk about all at once in minimization based formulations of inverse problems and their regularization. Please, Barbara. Okay, let me start with thanking the organizers for putting up such a nice workshop uh, with so nice talks, which I enjoyed very much. And uh, well, let me especially join the others with thanking Bernd for putting up so many nice Chemnitz inverse problems workshops. And I hope very much that this will continue. Okay, so. What I would, would like to talk about uh, today is on formulations of inverse problems and also their regularization uh, that are kind of uh, tuned towards uh, avoiding forward operators. And you will see in a moment what I mean by that. So just to give an outline, I will start with a, a few examples to um, kind of motivate what I'm doing and kind of fit also to the title of this workshop here. And well, and then I will first of all compare reduced formulations that they are usually, as they are usually done in inverse problems with so-called all at once versions. And finally, I would like to move on to an even more general way of formulating inverse problems, namely minimization based. So starting with some examples, so this is kind of the mother of all uh, parameter identification problems with actually different versions in it. So we have an elliptic boundary value problem and we have some coefficients inside. And we would like to identify these coefficients from observations of the state u, maybe at the boundary, then it will be, might be something related also to electrical impedance tomography if we assume that we know c and b, they are just zero and we want to identify A, this would be uh, the problem that uh, Bastian has shown us very nicely yesterday. Um, well, many of these problems can be transformed into nonlinear inverse boundary, uh, nonlinear inverse source problems, so that you have the unknown only on the right hand side, but the price, <laughs> play, uh, the price to pay is that we have a nonlinear, possibly elliptic uh, PDE as a model, so in all cases, either in this formulation or in this one, it will be nonlinear inverse problems to identify the parameters. And then to lift this to the time-dependent setting, uh, one could just look at an abstract ODE, which could be really an ODE or a system of ODEs, or if we work in function spaces and we plug in some uh, differential operator with respect to space here, then it will be also, for instance, parabolic or elliptic PDEs. And the observation that one typically has there is uh, observations over time. So, for instance, this one here, continuously over time, or as, uh, as it happens even more often, discrete observations over time. So, the abstract form of all these problems is to look at them as follows. So, we have some operator that models the that models the model, so the, some PDE or ODE in which both the 
search for parameter and the state, some state u, are involved. And then one has some observation op uh, equations. So for instance, c could be some trace operator if we observe at the boundary. And actually, it could also happen that c contains unknown parameters. So for instance, if one does not know some uh, distribution of, of noise or something like this, then one would put this in here. But for simplicity, I will just uh, denote dependence on the state u here. So these operators a and c will be the model operator and the observation operator in the following, and of course a map between Hilbert or Banach spaces. So in the classically reduced approach, one will eliminate one of these variables. So uh, one will use the parameter to state map that maps Q to U such that this model is satisfied. And then one will plug this into the observations and out comes the forward operator F. And we equate f to f of q to y, and then we have noisy data y, and so on and so forth. So the all at once formulation is just simply to um, go back, so to say, to this original formulation and look at it as a system in function spaces. And so this is this kind of bold face f, a bit like this forward operator, just that it has two variables inside, so to say namely the parameter and the state as well. So just to um, illustrate what this forward operator would mean in the examples, so S maps, for instance, one of these parameters or all of them uh, to the solution of the elliptic boundary value problem up here, or it would map the source on the right-hand side to the solution of the PDE again, or it would here map the parameter theta to the solution of this abstract ODE. And generally, uh, for some kind of arbitrary forward model, a model here, um, the, for the parameter to state map would be implicitly defined by just plugging in uh, the right U here, corresponding to Q, so to say. So, this reduced formulation has some drawbacks, namely that it requires the existence of this parameter to state map, which comes with some restrictions. And well, for instance, uh, if one wants to identify these parameters A and C, then typically one would require in order to get re uh, ellipticity that these are non-negative, which well makes sense and is not uh, really a trouble at the exact solution. But when iterating towards the solution of the inverse problems, it might make sense to go via stages where these constraints are not satisfied in order to get more freedom in making, so to say, big steps in the optimization. And while well, this becomes particularly pronounced uh, if one has PDEs with singularities. So I put an example here of uh, a model, a time-dependent model for a microelectromechanical system, which actually comes from joint work with Christian Klaasson. Uh, where we aimed at uh, recovering these parameters B and A. I will not say anything about what they mean from observations of U. And as you see here in this term where these parameters arise, um, we have a singularity at U equals to minus one. And due to this singularity, uh, in order to have a well-defined parameter to state map here, one would have to be very restrictive about the domain of B and A. Actually too restrictive to uh, reach the goals that one wants to reach with these uh, microelectromechanical -elect systems. Uh, well, another argument for looking at all at once formulations is that it's, it's really something different. Well, it should be in order to be investigated. Uh, first of all, in its implementation, as I will show you in a moment, and also in the analysis, as I will not show you in detail, namely concerning the conditions on the nonlinearity of the forward operator, which, as uh, Bastian illustrated nicely yesterday, can be really um, a pain, actually. And, well, just also to mention that I'm for sure not the first person to, to consider all at once, formulations, let me just show you a few references. Some of them are already quite old, so to say, uh, they come from um, PD constraint optimization, 
And a bit later on, people have been looking at this also in the context of inverse problems. So let me first of all compare reduced versus all at once formulations. And for this purpose, well, let me recall this slide. Now it's color coded, so the reduced one will always be purple and the all at once one will be this light blue. And I would like to look together with you at three paradigms for doing regularization, namely Tichonov regularization, Newton type methods and gradient type methods. So let me start with Tichonov and with the reduced setting. So this is all, what you all know, of course. We minimize the data misfit in the reduced formulation, kind of least squares formulation, plus some regularization term that depends on the parameter Q. And some regularization parameter, we heard about this also. I will not go into detail about alpha. Well, to write this in terms of the A and C operators, uh, let's look at this one here. So what we actually have is that we define the forward operator via this parameter to state map S. And we can consider this fact here, which is written down here, this definition of the parameter to state map as a constraint in doing this minimization. So let's put it as an equality constraint and then we can write f of q as c of u subject to this constraint. So this is an equivalent way of writing the ticket of regularization up here as a PDE constraint optimization problem. So Tichon of regularization itself has also been considered, of course, by many people. Also here, it's just a small selection of references, starting with the analysis in Hilbert spaces and then uh, a bit more recently in Banach spaces as well. So how does it look in an all-at-once formulation? Now our operator F consists of two components. We have to uh, penalize, uh, penalize deviation from zero in both components. So we do so for the uh, observation and for the model. So we put a norm here. One can do something else. Later on you will see maybe more general choices but uh, one can choose to use a square here or something else. So if you choose to use, for instance, a first power instead of the square, and if you multiply by a, a penalty parameter rho that is sufficiently large but finite, uh, actually by um, exact penalization arguments, one can prove that as soon as rho is above some threshold, this term here forces the quantity under the norm to be zero. And then it becomes an equality constraint. So actually, uh, in this way of formulating the problem, Tichon of regularization all at once, Tichon of regularization is just what we already had, reduced Tichon of regularization. With one small difference, uh, I put here also in light, very light blue, uh, a possible regularization of u as well. So in classical Tichonov, one would only regularize with respect to q, but one could add a term that acts on u, acts on the state, and this can actually be quite helpful, maybe not directly for doing regularization, but for, for instance, proving that minimizers exist. Okay, let's move on to the Newton type methods. And uh, so we iterate now, we have some iterate QK and we want to do the next step. And we do so by linearizing the forward operator. So we are again in the reduced regime now and we linearize under the norm, so to say, that's this Gauss-Newton paradigm. Well, we add some regularization, again with some regularization parameter that might be chosen differently in each step. And well, writing this down in terms of C and A, by using this identity here, leads to this formulation. So what we get is, first of all, this original model, so to say the nonlinear model, in order to get the right U tilde, to plug in, into C of U tilde in order to get the right F of QK here. And the second constraint here concerns the linearization of the model in order to plug in, so to say, the right quantity u 
here in order to end up with the same thing as up here, so to say. So again, well, there's some literature, also just a selection of it, on Gauss-Newton methods. So there's also levenberg marquardt which I will not go into detail about at all. Um, well, it's just an example of a method. So what happens if we, again, go back to this all-at-once formulation? And well, then we have two components, now the observations and the model, and both of them are linearized under the norm, and then we have some kind of penalization of them plus regularization of Q and possibly also of U. When we can again play the game and put, instead of a square, put the first power here, put the penalization parameter here, and then this becomes a linearly constrained minimization problem. So now the question arises, is this again the same or basically the same as the reduced formulation as it was the case for Tichonov before? And for this purpose, let's look at the optimality conditions because that's what one really uses in computations. So what we see here is, of course, the constraints. So this nonlinear and the linear constraint in the reduced setting plus some additional equations that come from differentiating the Lagrangian with respect to the other variables. So the gradient equation, the adjoint equation, it's adjoint because we have an adjoint of the linearization of the model operator. And well, in the all at once setting, we basically have the same thing, but there's a big difference, namely we don't have this nonlinear model equation here. So that's actually the key difference between these two formulations, the reduced and the all at once. Here we have to, we kind of pre-compute the U tilde to plug it in here. And down here we don't need to do this because we iterate for U. We iterate for U as, so to say, simultaneously at, with iterating for Q. So now going down to, to gradient-based methods, uh, which come from um, just applying gradient descent to this quadratic minimization problem and again stopping early enough. This leads to what is known as Landweber iteration or with more sophisticated choices of the step, step size, steepest descent or minimal error methods. And as we have seen very nicely in Thomas' talk on um, Tuesday, uh, this can be extended to something much faster, of course. But I, I here just look at the very basic version. And well, again, the goal is to write in, in terms of the A and the C operator. And well, what we get out is this one here. So first of all, just plugging in the definition from up here, then applying the chain rule. So here exchanging the order because of the um, adjoint here, and then uh, using basically the implicit function theorem to see what this S prime here is. And well, this does not fit quite into this line anymore, so we introduce a new variable P. Uh, P has to satisfy an adjoint equation. So this is a bit similar to what we saw in the optimality conditions. So again, we have to solve a nonlinear mo model in order to get the U tilde here, and then we have to solve an adjoint equation in order to really get the gradient step. So again, <clears throat> well, of course I have to mention the seminal paper here for the analysis of, of um, um, land iteration in Hilbert spaces by Martin Hanke, Andreas Neubau, and Ottmar Scherzer. So, Let's play the game for the all-at-once formulation where the operator F has these two components explicitly, A and C. Well, and it's very simple to write this down. So differentiation of this thing leads to this kind of matrix of linear operators here. We have to adjoin and multiply and what comes out is just this one here. And as you see, there's nothing like a linearized or nonlinear model equation that has to be solved. We don't m solve any model actually, not even the adjoint one. We just plug in quantities into the linearized model operator. 
So the question arises whether will this work, and you will see in a moment whether or not it, this will work. So just a few words about the convergence analysis. So that's the, that's the usual program of proving well-definedness, so existence of minimizers whenever minimizers are needed. Stability, convergence, convergence rates under appropriate um, regularity assumptions. And well, this can really be done in a straightforward manner as long as one does the regularization with respect to Q and U because then one just plugs in um, the operator into the existing results on the reduced formulation and then writes down what it means for the all at once formulation. So it becomes a bit more tricky if one does regularization with respect to Q only in the all at once formulation because one, ha one needs a means also for to in order to bound the state in some way if one doesn't uh, regularize it explicitly. And that's done by, for instance, using such a boundedness condition, which is actually not nice because um, with the implicit function theorem, this is kind of uh, a sufficient condition for existence of the parameter to state map, which we actually want to avoid. But, well, as soon as we add regularization with respect to U, we don't need this anymore. Okay, well, just the last point I would like to mention, as I as said before, these conditions on the non-linearity, so for instance, the tangential con conditions that was mentioned by, the, by Bastian or also other alternative conditions, uh, they are quite often more easy to be satisfied in the all at once setting because one just has more freedom in the choice of function spaces, namely especially the space where the model is supposed to hold. So let me show you some numerical results and first of all just very simple 1D. So we have a nonlinear inverse source problem with a xi or theta, it's a theta here, so with this theta which is not to be an unknown, so but a um, kind of tuning parameter, we can make this problem more or less nonlinear. So large theta, large positive theta um, will lead to a very nonlinear problem, so to say small theta equal to zero is just linear. And also we will look at negative theta in order to see uh, what happens if the parameter to state map that is not well defined anymore, which will happen as soon as this term is not monotone anymore. So it has not the right sign. And also to keep the setting very simple, we assume that we have measurements of U all over the domain. And well, what happens to Landweber then is the following. So maybe let's first of all look at this column here. So we have the different values of theta starting from almost linear to getting more and more nonlinear, and then we also have these negative values down here. And again, there's this color coding for all at once and reduced. So reduced wins whenever the, um, the column for CPU times is in purple and all at once wins as soon as we, are, we have lower CPU times for all at once, yes. So the iteration counts are kind of astronomical as usual for Landweber, but maybe let's just con concentrate on the CPU times. And what happens is the following. So if we are almost linear, then all at once is fine. So the problem with all at once is when we go to the very nonlinear regime or more nonlinear regime actually, then it does not really work anymore as you see here from the, from the errors. So then the reduced one is working better and actually it works fine, of course, after many steps, one should say. Um, well, as soon as we go below, so 0 0.5 is still elliptic because of the Laplace operator. Minus one is not elliptic anymore. And then again, we only have a chance to do something with the all at once version. Okay, Newton type methods are better in many respects. So first of all, uh, one can go to stronger nonlinearities as you see here, also on the negative side. And the nice thing is also that uh, all at once always wins. 
And while it's clear only in the reduced, only in the linear case, the reduced version does not need more than the all at once because, well, then it's then this nonlinear model, a of q and u equals to zero, is actually a linear model, and it is not costly. It's not no more costly than in, in the all at once um, case to solve it. So just to show you also 2D pictures. Um, I've taken this example from a joint paper with Alana Kirchner and Boris Wechsler from uh, Munich, where we did um, also adaptive discretization for this um, kind of problem. Again, it's the same test problem here. The difference is that we are in 2D, and so we need a bit more than just my MATLAB code to compute things, also because of adaptivity. And well, so for example, this would be an exact source and the corresponding reconstructions. The methods that we compared there was reduced Tikhonov and all at once Gauss Newton. So these are the corresponding states U. And well, to show you that this adaptive mesh, what you see here also is uh, actually we did not do boundary measurements, because if there would be boundary measurements, the, the adaptive discretization would be concentrated on the boundary, of course. We have interior measurements, and yet maybe you even see uh, at certain discrete points we have refined meshes in order to, so to say, get out the information from the measurements. So this is a kind of rather nonlinear version here, and you see uh, the comparison also shows that the all at once version is faster if the problem becomes more nonlinear because then solving the nonlinear mo model becomes more costly. And as you see here, for a very strong nonlinearities, we get a very pronounced uh, advantage of the um, all at once version as compared to the reduced Tikhonov. So, how much time do I have? I just go, okay. So I would like to say also a few things about minimization based formulations because they are kind of more, um, even more general, so to say, more fancy. And for this purpose, let me recall shortly the reduced and the all at once versions. And well, more generally, one could write down the inverse problem as a minimization problem. Not only its regularization, but also already the inverse problem itself with some cost function j depending on, sorry, it's x now, so what was q before is x now, uh, with some state u and with the data y, here still the exact data, and with some admissible set for the parameter and the state. So this looks very abstract, so what does this have to do with these two things up here? Well, of course, one has to choose the cost function and the uh, admissible set in a proper way. And before showing you this, uh, let me mention that this um, kind of uh, minimization-based formulation of inverse problems is first of all not completely new, but also that it has been rediscovered kind of simultaneously by Stefan Kindermann and myself, where Stefan did, did it with a, based on, on this kind of reduced formulation and my point of view was more to avoid the, this parameter to state mapping. So, first of all, to show that the reduced formulation is a special case of the minimization based formulation, uh, let's write down an um, appropriate cost function, j of x, u, and y, so that this really becomes equivalent. So, and actually, we did not, I did not put any constraints here. I put everything into the cost function, so for this purpose I also use this nice uh, indicator function that Christian has is explained in his talk. So this is a way, so there are other ways to uh, write the reduced formulation as a minimization based formulation. So all at once, so with this A and C operator, we can for instance use another misfit functional Q in order to penalize deviation of the model from the model, 
besides penalizing deviation from the data, and then it would, for instance, look like this. Again, actually, we just don't put any constraints, put everything into the cost function, for instance. There are other ways to do that. Okay, how to regularize something like this? So this is actually uh, the one of the nice things about these formulations, it's quite obvious how to do this. So we have, uh, well, just to say why we are regularizing, we have the of observations. So we can, for instance, just add some regularization term here for X and U. And we can also modify the feasible set in order to incorporate the noisy data here. So, Regularization is here done by, well, for instance, adding this term here, but also we can plug in some <coughs> regularization back here, as you will see in a moment, which is this Ivanov type of uh, doing regularization. Well, and of course, we also have to take into account that we have this perturbed version of the data, so how to get this into the place, for instance, by also adding some something in the cost function and or adding something in the constraints, which could look as like this, for instance. So we have the, this previous formulation of the inverse problem with the two misfit functionals for the model and the, for the model and for the observations. First of all, without any constraints. And we could do regularization, for instance, by adding a term back here and also adding a bound using a certain functional R tilde on X and U. Or if we do it like this, if we just put the um, penalization of the model devi um, deviation from the model into the cost function and put the um, observations into the constraints, then one could say, well, we regularize just by adding some regularization term here and again, this bound, and we relax this equality in the observations, for instance, in this Morozov type way, where delta is the noise level of the true data. So, well, just very briefly about convergence analysis, just to show you that it exists, so to say, and that we have, so to say, the typical assumptions, and then one can prove also what one usually expects to prove, namely, First of all, well-definedness well of the method, so existence of minimizers, and then convergence as the noise level goes to zero with an appropriate choice of the regularization parameter in a certain topology that has to fit the regularization terms and so on. So, but instead of looking at this in detail, I what I would like to show you is that there beyond these all at once things with A and C, there are also minimization-based formulations that have been devised previously, and the machinery that I've shown you now allows to, in, in, to add regularization to that. And this is the so-called variational approach to EIT by, uh, first of all, so to say, invented by Kohn and Fogelius, and later on applied actually to many other inverse problems. So, you know EIT already from Bastian's talk, so I no need to say much about this. We want to identify a conductivity in this relation here between the electric field E and the current density J. And Maxwell's equations tell us that J, actually in the quasi-static regime, tell us that uh, J is divergence-free and E is solenoidal, so curl-free, and then what we have, ah, the other way around, sorry, but, well, the, the curl of E is zero, so let's put it like this, and we are in 2D, so we can write the curl like this. Well, and therefore, we can, um, th there exist potentials, yes, if you are in a simply connected domain, uh, a divergence-free vector field has a scalar potential, and something like this, so something with uh, a zero rotation has a vector potential, which, which again becomes a scalar potential in the 2D case, so like this. So we have these potentials, psi and phi, and 
writing it down with these potentials, then these, are, these equations are automatically satisfied. We only have to care about this one here. And we write it down like this. So E and J are written with the potentials. And sigma is kind of distributed, so to say, evenly to both sides. So we keep square root of sigma on the E side, so to say, and we put another square root of sigma on the J side. Well, and we have a counter here. I goes from one to capital I because we have many measurements, or at least we have several me measurements um, of boundary currents and voltages. So these measured currents and voltages then become just boundary conditions for these potentials here. Actually, for the, uh, for the, for the psi, we first of all have to integrate the, the measured currents along the boundary, but it's not a big deal, actually. And well, then we end up with this equivalent formulation of EIT. Well, and for instance, we can write this like this as a minimization problem. So we put this thing here into the cost function. We want to minimize the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side in an L2 sense. And we put these two things as constraints or actually these two I things as constraints. Well, and actually if we multiply out this um, square here and use the fact that the L2 inner product between uh, the gra a gradient and the curl is zero, so that we have this orthogonality up to boundary terms, which are however known, so we can skip them in the minimization, we end up with this formulation. Well, how to regularize this? Well, there are several ways of doing so. For instance, this one here. So this is again the formulation, first of all, just with the difference here. And what we do about the equality constraints is to relax them like this. So these are kind of, um, these are box constraints, so to say, upper and lower bounds on phi i or and psi i, uh, so that they are not exactly the measured data, but close to them. And closeness is measured again in this Morozov-type style by means of the noise level in the exact data. And well, what we do about regularization is this one. So we do regularization by imposing constraints, so pointwise constraints on the conductivity. And actually, just in order to have uh, well-definedness of minimizers, we also put some regularization for the states here. Okay, and then one can just uh, see the, view this as a special case of uh, what we had before and end up with some theorem. Without going into details, just maybe in case you are interested, this is the topology in which we get conversions. So also we have this sigma and one over sigma and L infinity like Bastian. And while we have these spaces that are kind of um, come from the regularization, for the states and also the, the traces explicitly. Okay, just to wrap up, um, what I kind of uh, aim to do is to, to compare, first of all, reduced and all advanced versions for these three types of regularization methods, namely Tikhonov, where reduced is very close to all at once, actually, but still all at once is more general. So with more general uh, model penalizations, it, it become something different from reduced. Newton type methods, there the big difference is that uh, for the reduced models we have to solve non, uh, for the reduced formulation we have to solve nonlinear models. For the all at once formulation we just solve linearized models. And in land wave iteration it becomes more extreme even so in, in the all at once version we never solve any models. And while this minimization-based approach is just a generalization of this, and which has the, the nice um, feature of being able to, to capture regularization and data misfit penalization in many different ways, and also to capture something which really goes beyond this all-at-once approach. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and say obrigada.